Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June 2nd, 2015 planning and zoning meeting. If you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, then a moment of silence. If we could have roll call from left to right, please. Anthony Sutton. Mike Dolan. John Grant. Edward Mead. Tom Nickel. Tom Panzella. Jim Quish. And I am Ben Genninger, also present, our David Sulkis board clerk, and I'm sorry, David Sulkis city planner, and Phyllis Leggett board clerk. The first item on the agenda is new business, 220 Rock Lane, zone LI. Good evening. For the record, my name is Rob Blanchett. I'm with Borghese, and we're building and we're representing Stevens Manufacturing, which is 220 Rock Lane. The one item that you're missing from the, um, the package that you have there are original copies of the uh, survey for the property. All the information that's on here, though, already is on those drawings, but I would like to hand these in. I believe it's a it's a fairly straightforward application. Um, there is existing right now Stevens Manufacturing. Uh, they manufacture aircraft and helicopter parts. There is a building which they function out of now currently, which is 37,700 square feet, and what we're proposing is a 28,800 square foot addition, which is going to be used for additional manufacturing and warehousing space. On the site now, there are existing buildings located right along would be the uh, northeast side of the property. There is an existing abandoned building which is on the site which is going to be demolished, which is right in the area where the addition is going to be. So in essence, the building is going to be of an L-shaped nature. We are going to add some extra parking on there. The requirements total parking on the site would be 100. We're going to at put in a total of 65 now and looking to defer 36 spaces. I mean, they don't even require the 65 spaces for what they have for parking. The other thing that we're going to do is right now they only have one loading dock, which is located here, and you really can't access it with a truck now. You would have to back in off the road. So one of the other things that we're going to do is add a loading area on here which can be accessed completely on site by a tractor trailer maneuver onto the property back up to the loading area and be able to pull out without having to come in off of the road the project itself it meets all the requirements for height uh, lot coverage all of those items um, and in addition to that we're going to also add some landscaping in the parking areas and along a wetland which is on the northwest side of the property. Um, all the drainage, you have the drainage calculations, that's all going to be taken care of with underground uh, detention. Um, in a nutshell, I mean, we've, I think we've addressed all of the concern of the various town departments. I'm not sure if anybody on the commission has any specific questions on the project. Thank you. Any comments from staff? You have the, uh, the staff report. The only thing I'll point out and make you aware of uh, is that uh, on the easternmost parking area, uh, that uh, parking area does go into, uh, it is, it's pre-existing non-conforming. Uh, there is supposed to be a 10-foot buffer there that is not, uh, but I just want to make you aware of that. Thank you. Any questions from the board? 
Seeing none, anyone would like to make a motion? Mr. Quish. I, I, would, uh, I would move to approve as presented. Having a motion, do we have a second? Second. Having a motion and a second, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone against, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is 11 Warfield Street. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Just for the record, my name is Thomas Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton. My office is located here in Milford at 63 Cherry Street. And I'm here tonight representing Gary Doolin. Uh, Mr. Doolin is on a cruise in Alaska right now, but his son, who actually will be operating the proposed business here at 11 Warfield Street, is here with me tonight, along with uh, Michael Zarnecki, who's the owner of the property. Uh, Michael has operated Excello Tool <clears throat> here in Milford for many, many years, and uh, he has reached a uh, proposed contract to sell this property to uh, Gary uh, to operate an auto body repair facility uh, in this building that has been uh, in existence since 1955. Uh, I assume that most of the board members are aware of Gary. He runs a very successful business in Devon. Uh, Doolin Automotive. It's highly rated uh, uh, by the Better Business Bureau as well as uh, uh, anyone who has dealt with him over the years in terms of automobile repair. And uh, his son Gary graduated from technical school a couple of years ago, has gone into the family business, and now the uh, envisioned proposal is to purchase this property and to start a secondary uh, arm of the business, uh, i.e. auto body repair. That's <clears throat> the specific area, area that Gary Jr. had studied in tech school and wants to uh, pursue, pursue that. Now, we did uh, appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals back in uh, December of last year because there were a number of variances that were required to allow this particular use uh, in this building. The building is located in the LI zone, and one of the nuances of the LI zone is to uh, have a minimum square footage of one acre to operate either a auto repair facility, or a gasoline service station, or in this case, because it does fall under the same uh, zone uh, regulations and definitions, an auto body uh, repair facility. So we did appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals back in December. <clears throat> there was a variance requested for the lot area, the width of the property, because that was a pre-existing nonconformity, as well as the parking count, because uh, a portion of the property to the uh, west, you can see that uh, actually the property consists of two parcels of land. Uh, the total aggregate square footage is some 16,600 square feet. Uh, there's one appendage parcel to the south along the um, uh, Metro North uh, right-of-way uh, consisting of about 4,000 square feet and the other parcel is some 12,000 square feet. So the total aggregate uh, constitutes 0.38 acres and that necessitated the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the variance. So the, the, the actual four variances that we requested for the uh, frontage, the lot area, the zoning requirements, and the parking, because utilizing the area on that parcel, uh, the existing parking spaces, it was determined that a portion of those actually were improved over the years in uh, the right of way of the uh, railroad. So after meeting with Steve Harris and putting together the application, that as well was one of the requested variances. The Zoning Board of Appeals, after its public hearing, granted all of these variances. Um, a neighbor across the street from uh, the property at, uh, uh, I think it was 16 Warfield Street, filed an appeal uh, in Superior Court of the Zoning Board, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, approval of the variances. 
I was able to file an appearance on behalf of Mr. Doolin and in concert with Matthew Woods, the assistant city attorney, a settlement has been reached of that case with the uh, neighbor. It's going to involve uh, the planting of a landscape uh, buffer along his property at the curve of Warfield Street, uh, and in consideration for that, uh, that appeal is going to be dropped. So the last step in the process was to come before this board to seek uh, the special permit and the site plan uh, approval, uh, uh, which is appropriate under the zoning regulations. In this zone, the LI zone, a auto uh, body repair facility is a special use upon submission of the site plan. And quite briefly, there's going to be no changes whatsoever to the building. Uh, as you see it, that's how it's going to be used. The auto uh, uh, body repair facility will be completely within the confines of the building. The majority of the parking, because of that appendage parcel that I referred to, uh, the majority of the parking for any cars that will be worked on or serviced will be in that rear area. Uh, so it will be buffered and screened from the uh, street. But there will not be any addition to the property, uh, no alterations to the uh, property whatsoever. So with that said, it's a fairly straightforward proposal. I've gone over it with Mr. Sulkis. He has a memo that he's submitted to you. And uh, if the board has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Any additional comments from staff? Uh, not at this time. Any questions from the board? Mr. Nickel. Yeah, I, I surveyed that piece of property down, and I was under the understanding that they were going to improve that, improve the site, clean it up, uh, do the repaving, and uh, fix the cracks, and get the weeds out of there, make it look better. Well, they certainly do intend to do that. I'm just saying there's not going to be any addition to the building. There will be no uh, alteration or addition to the structure itself. But certainly, yes, uh, they are going to clean the property up once they take title to it. <clears throat> One other question. He's putting in a, uh, uh, I guess, a up-to-date, very technical spray booth? That's correct. That's correct. We did go into that uh, uh, at the public hearing for the ZBA. I do have some materials left from that file in this file. Uh, I didn't submit them to you because uh, uh, we did have the record from that hearing. But, uh, Tom, you are correct. There's a state-of-the-art uh, uh, painting of, and uh, ventilation system that's going to be installed in the uh, building. And um, uh, as I said, all of the work will be done inside of the building. They're going to have an updated air conditioning system so that even during the summertime, uh, any work will be done not with garage doors open uh, with any noise going to the outside. And with that said, I will add that this has been a machine shop building for some 60 years, so uh, uh, it is located in an industrial zone. Uh, we like to think that uh, this use is going to be an improvement to the area in terms of a reduction of the noise. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Seeing none, we, um, Mr. Bead. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you tell me the hours of operation? Just 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, five days a week? Yes, five days okay, a week. Okay, thanks. Monday through Friday. Any uh, questions from the board? Seeing none, we will open this up for public comment. Before I go over the procedure, is there anyone in attendance either for or against this application? Um, so the procedure is if you could please approach the podium, clearly state your name and address and please spell your name, address all comments to the commission. If your comments have been previously presented, please refrain from repeating. State your comments in a clear and succinct manner and please try to keep your comments under three minutes. If you're for the application, you can come to the podium. Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Solomon. I live at 109 Pascal Drive in Milford. Um, I have, uh, for the past 37 years, been um, an employee of Excello Tool on Warfield Street in Milford, where the uh, um, proposed um, variance is, is asked for. Um, I think that um, I've known Gary Doolin for probably 20 years since I've been doing business with him. 
I know that he's done uh, a fantastic job on um, Bridgeport Avenue, taking his, his um, business from um, a, a broken down old gas station to what he does now. He's a very good uh, community servant. He does a lot. Uh, I'm a past president of Devon Rotary Club. He's very supportive of that. Uh, Bethel Shelter. I, I don't believe that uh, um, there's any bad that can happen uh, with this property. Um, I, I definitely think that it's a great opportunity for uh, Warfield Street to have a, another um, um, successful business there, um, and, I, and I hope that you approve this uh, application. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else for the application? Seeing none, is there anyone against the application? <coughs> Seeing no one, any other comments or questions from the board before we close the record? Seeing none, the record's closed. Does anyone see a reason why we can't vote tonight? Seeing none, would anyone like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll, uh, I, I'll make a motion um, to approve 11 Warfield Street as presented for special permit and site plan review approval to establish an auto repair facility on map 23, block 344, parcel 1, 1A, of which XLO Realty LLC is the owner. I'll second. Start. Having a motion in two seconds, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone against? Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on, don't go far, Mr. Lynch. The next item on the agenda is 335 Meadowside Road, Zone R 12.5. All set? Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the record. Uh, Thomas Lynch with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton. Uh, offices at 63 Cherry Street here in Milford. And I'm here tonight representing uh, Greg and Chris Field. They're the managing members of 335 Meadowside LLC, the owners of the property, uh, the subject of uh, which we've uh, presented this application to you tonight for special permit and site plan review to approve the construction of a 18-unit multifamily residential development on the property in accordance with the sections of uh, the pertinent sections of Section 830G of our Connecticut statutes. <clears throat> I also have with me tonight, along with Chris and Buddy, uh, Bob Weeway from Coda Spody Associates, who put together the site plan, and he's going to be going through that in a minute. And also David Spear, who has prepared a traffic study for us 
It was submitted to you as part of your package before tonight, and he's going to be going through that. <clears throat> So just by way of background, the property is located in uh, zone R12-5 on Meadowside Road. Meadowside Road, quite bluntly, is a major feeder street bringing traffic from Milford Center out to the west shore of Milford through the west shore beach areas in Devon. On this property is a house that was constructed in 1879. It's some 1,600 square feet that's in a highly dilapidated state. It has no historical significance. It has no architectural significance. It has been converted over the years through additions uh, to three levels. It has had its windows replaced. It has had its siding replaced. It has had the plaster walls inside completely ripped out with modern uh, electrical and plumbing put in some 40 or 50 years ago. So even though this structure was built in 1879, it deserves to be demolished, and it will be demolished as part of this project. In conjunction with that, I've given you a handout showing what we propose. I think the second page is a uh, uh, basic uh, compilation of the site plan layout. Uh, there's going to be six buildings constructed on the property, all on uh, the uh, east side of the property, leaving a parking area and a snow shelf on the westerly side of the property. Each of the buildings are going to have three units constructed in the same manner that my clients constructed the development that was approved by this board back in November of 2013 and has been successfully completed, uh, located at uh, 229 West Main Street here in Milford. The last few pictures that are included in the handout are the interiors of the units at 229 West Main Street. And I think these, these pictures speak for themselves. It shows the quality of construction that my clients uh, have exhibited, both in this particular project and the other projects that they and their family members have worked on here in Milford for over 35 years. That project also has three units designated as affordable units. And we've talked a lot over the last few months about numbers and st statistics. But with this project at 229 West Main Street, we actually have people living in them now. Those units have been completed. There are people moving in there now. The three affordable units there are being occupied by graduate students. They're being occupied by a single mother with a 16-year-old son at Jonathan Law High School, who I believe is going to be here tonight to tell you what it means to her to be able to live in Milford in an apartment that has a rent that is based upon affordable considerations that allows her to live in Milford. And my clients have read the blogs, and they've seen the ads, uh, and they've seen the online petitions, and they've seen the comments talking about what the affordable projects will bring to Milford and reading the comments about leaving them in Bridgeport. That's not what this project is about, and that's not what any of the projects that have been brought before you over the last six months from whether it's Richard Friedman or the Fields or other developers. That's not what is going on here. This is not the development of low-income housing. This is the development of affordable housing. And I've said it till I'm blue in the face that there's a distinct difference between that. Previous to tonight, you all got an affordability plan that I put together. It's the fourth one that I've done over the last year and a half. The numbers don't lie. There's going to be six units in this complex, six two-bedroom units that are going to have rents that are going to be computed upon the formula set forth in 830G. And for the two-bedroom dwellings in this project, for those individuals earning 80% of the state median, that means a family income of $62,000. Hardly low income. Those are your teachers. Those are your policemen. Those are your firemen. Those are the people who work at Sikorsky. Those are young professionals coming out with their first jobs. And they can stay in Milford. They can stay in Milford and afford to live in a building like you're seeing in those pictures right there. That's what this project is about. 
And my clients are proud to bring this uh, application to you tonight. They're not trying to ram something down your throats. They're proud to be able to come in with a piece of property that they are not contract purchasers of, I might add. They own this property. They've been paying taxes on this property for the past nine years. So it's not like they've gone out to try to find a piece of land and bring it before you and try to, you know, hire Coda Spody to come in with a site plan and hire me to come in and uh, make a pitch to you. They own this property. But they do want to take advantage of a state statute that encourages builders to take properties like this, to develop them, and to have a portion of the finished units be devoted to individuals that meet certain income guidelines. And that's what this is all about. The other point that I wanted to make to you in that handout that I've just given to you is the proximity of this property to four other multifamily uh, developments within some three or 400 feet of the site. If you look at the top page, Buddy uh, went to the assessor's uh, office and made a color copy of the assessor's map and you can see right on here that the Metaside condominiums, that was a, an apartment conversion from the 1970s. There's 44 units, they're all two bedroom units, 370 feet from our site. Right across the street from the Meadowside apartments or condominiums are the Oyster Bay condominiums. There's 70 units there, 70. We have 18 in our project. That's 145 feet from the proposed site directly across the street from my client's property. The Milford Redevelopment Senior Center, the Mayo Drive, 95 units, 195 feet from my client's property. And then lastly, to the rear of my client's property, just off of the Silver Sands uh, uh, access way is the Alber Alberta Jago Senior Center with 40 units, affordable senior housing, just like the Mayo Drive, affordable senior housing. So this stretch of Meadowside Road, it's in an area, I want to use the term a hodgepodge of zoning. You've got single family zoning, you've got multifamily surrounding this site. This clearly will not be out of character with the neighborhood. And that's not a consideration that we even need to be concerned of when we bring an application under 830G, but I'm highlighting it to buttress the argument that this is not out of character with the area. There's certainly other multifamily uh, developments in the area, and uh, that's shown on uh, the graphic that we've given to you. Another page in the graphic, one of the blogs that you read online saying how this is going to uh, uh, burden the school system. We're going to be adding children to the school system. Well. We went to the Board of Ed. We took out statistics, and the statistics don't lie. Pages three and four in our handout to you show the current enrollment over the last two years at Meadowside School. We've highlighted it in blue. In school year 2013 to 2014, there were 461 students at Meadowside School. In the current school year, 2014 to 2015, there's 394 students in Meadowside School. That's a drop of 66 students at Meadowside School. So even if in these apartments we may have two or three additional students, well, maybe those two or three additional students will save a teacher's job. Maybe. I mean, is this what we want in, is this what we want in Milford? Is, do we want to shrink? Do we, do, we want to sh do we want to shrink our school system? Do we want to diminish the vitality of this town? I take the, I take the position in bringing these applications to you that by encouraging a development like this, it has young people coming in, starting their lives, paying their own way, and then they stay in Milford. And I think that that's something that ne really needs to be taken into consideration with this application. <clears throat> the last point that I wanted to make to you before turning the uh, podium over to Bob to go through the uh, um, site plan with you is the affordability plan that I uh, put together. As I said, there's going to be six units in this complex. They're all two-bedroom units that will be affordable. Article 10 
under the uh, affordability plan calculates the 80 percent uh, average, the 80 percent of the uh, statewide average, as I had said to you previously, 62,000. That's the family income for those living in the two-bedroom units. That's the maximum family income to qualify for those units. And the rent calculated on the state uh, guidelines for a two-bedroom two unit for a family earning 62,000 is 1398. That's probably some four to five hundred dollars a month less than apartments downtown or other apartments across the town. For the three individual apartments that would be calculated based on the 60% of the statewide median, the rent would be $1,066 a month. So as I said, I'm going to turn things over to Bob Weeway, but uh, uh, we feel, and we're, we'll, I'll conclude my comments once we get through uh, the site plan and the traffic, I'll conclude my comments with the thought that uh, clearly the location of this property, the approval of the project by the uh, Traffic Commission, by uh, uh, Officer Dumas and his review of the uh, uh, plans shows there's absolutely no public health or safety issue that's uh, uh, present here. The fire department has signed off on the plans completely. The buildings will be sprinklered. Uh, but when we get into traffic, and I'm going to leave that up to David Spear, the main thrust in determining public health and safety in these situations is sight lines. Can the road adequately handle 18 units, two cars for each unit coming out at staggered times onto Meadowside Road? I went down there last night to do a drive-by of the property. There was a city bus. The, uh, the property is located on the uh, city bus line. So I dare say that if there's residents that are living in these uh, apartments who are going to be taking the train, they're going to be taking a bus from the property into the center of Milford and then getting on a train. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. But all in all, I feel that Every aspect of this plan has been reviewed by the town departments, has been approved by the town departments. There's no presence of any health or safety issues that would give rise to outweighing, as the statute says, the public need for affordable housing in this community. So I'd ask that you consider all that, and I'm going to turn things over to Bob. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Weeway, and a uh, licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut and principal with uh, Coda Spodian Associates. Our offices are located at uh, 263 Boston Post Road in Orange, Connecticut. Um, Coda Spodian Associates uh, basically was responsible for providing the uh, survey and site plan development and engineering for uh, the application that's before you tonight. Uh, Jeff Gordon from our office. Um, was heavily involved with the site planning and the uh, landscape architecture and lighting plan for, for the development. If you take a look at sheet SP1 of your uh, packet, uh, that contains the majority of the site plan elements for the site. And what you can see on that particular plan are the uh, buildings that have been depicted. Um, as Mr. Lynch pointed out, there's a total of 18 units uh, scattered between the, uh, six, no, between the six buildings. Each unit, with the exception of uh, this end unit down here will also have a uh, uh, garage space for parking of vehicles. Um, each unit will also have parking loading in, in front of each unit, along with, if, um, along with additional parking for the units and visitors along the westerly portion of the property. Um, when we take a look at the site itself, um, the topography is generally flat. Uh, for those people that have been out there, the, the topography is generally uh, in the 2% range. 
Um, we did a number of testing out there um, with, uh, with deep test holes with regards to the stormwater management system. And uh, the soils are, are generally uh, good from a hydrological uh, perspective. Uh, when we take a look at the site plan, um, between what's out there under existing conditions and proposed, for the existing conditions, there's approximately 0.13 acres of impervious surface area right now between the uh, houses, um, the driveway, sidewalks, and so on and so forth. With the proposed development plan, um, that will be increased to approximately 0.58 acres of impervious surface, and that includes the building areas and the parking areas um, associated with the site. Now, one of the things um, that when we take a look at those numbers from an engineering perspective, with the increases in impervious surface, typically um, you would expect to have increases in runoff uh, from that development if it's unmitigated. And with the calculations that we did, which were reviewed by your city engineer, um, that is in fact the case that if we provided no stormwater management for this particular project, there would be increases in both the peak rates of runoff and the volume of runoff. Um, However, um, we have provided a fairly detailed uh, stormwater management plan for the project. And uh, what we're going to be doing is incorporating um, what's referred to as a green stormwater management system, um, as recognized by both the EPA and the uh, Connecticut DEEP departments as a best management practice. Uh, the mechanism that we're going to use for controlling the increases in uh, volume and uh, peak rates of runoff are going to be um, concrete or in interlocking concrete uh, per pervious pavers. And again, if you take a look at the site plan on uh, sheet SP3. Excuse me, that microphone <laughs> detaches. If you could just. Uh, Excuse me? That microphone detaches if you want to bring okay. it with you. On sheet, S, on sheet SP4, which is the grading plan for the project, um, this particular sheet delineates the area that we're going to be um, providing the stormwater management system uh, for the concrete pavers. So basically, uh, the way that the system will work, we have the rooftop areas for each of the buildings. All the uh, gutters will be collected the stormwater, um, discharged through the downspouts. Everything will be collected through an underground system and discharged uh, between units uh, C and D to a water quality structure, uh, which is located here. The water quality structure is about 1,200, I think it's 1,250 uh, 1, gallons in size. Um, the primary purpose of that is to collect the water um, that's coming from the rooftop areas. It'll allow for the, settle, uh, for the uh, settling of any uh, suspended solids that may be in that stormwater runoff. And it's basically a segmented chamber where you have three chambers in there. One, one separates out uh, any oils and grease or floatables that may be in the stormwater runoff. Another chamber settles out the, um, uh, the suspended solids. And the third, the third one is basically used for the discharge system, which will go to the uh, uh, concrete pavers. Now, the, the paver system uh, is basically going to serve two purposes. There's surface runoff that will get to the pavers, both with the rainfall that falls on top of the pavers, as well as the, the parking and the pavement area that's, that's up tributary to the north. So what would happen is the runoff from this area would, would basically filter down through the parking area and hit the, uh, the concrete pavers in through here, where it would be intercepted by the pavers and flow to what's, what I would refer, refer to as an underground detention system. Uh, if you take a look on sheet SP8 of your drawings, there are a number of details on there that details this whole sy system out. Uh, but basically what we have is the concrete pavers, which have a, approximately a 3 8 to a half inch gap between each paver. That will allow for the interception of the stormwater runoff from that area to flow vertically down through the system and get into the underground uh, detention storage. The second component of that, which we've already hi highlighted, is going to be the runoff from the roof areas, which comes down through the water quality structure. That discharge will go directly to the stone reservoir system um, that's underneath neat, the pavers. So basically what happens is, you, is we have um, a big underground detention system, and for a lot of projects that, that this commission has reviewed in the past, 
It's very similar to, or the concept is very similar to an underground detention basin. Uh, what this commission is probably more familiar with is underground galleries and things along those lines. Uh, what this does, it, it basically allows us to put in a little bit shallower system, spread it out over a larger area, so that we have a larger footprint and contact area for the stormwater to collect within the system and have the ability to infiltrate into the underlying soils. Um, so with this proposed system and the calculations that we provided to the city engineer, we've been able to demonstrate to his satisfaction that we've provided for a zero increase in both, uh, in, in both in terms of runoff volume and peak rates of discharge for the city requirement of up to the 25-year storm event. Uh, we've also analyzed storms in, in excess of that uh, for storms all the way up to the 100 year. And even for those storms, we were able to provide for a zero increase in runoff for all storms that were analyzed uh, as part of that. For the 25 year storm, and I think what's, what would be significant for this commission for the 25 year storm, we basically have zero discharge that comes out of the system. So everything that is tributary to the pavers uh, basically is captured within the system and there's zero di discharge that comes out of it. So there is no overflow, there's no bypass or anything else. It's once you come into the 50 year events, um, the, the 50 year, or, or once we get above the 25 year rainfall event, that's where we have um, you know, some over overflow that comes out, but we're still able to provide for that zero increase in runoff um, for, for the volume and peaks. We've also incorporated at the request of the city engineer and public works director um, a trench drain uh, immediately adjacent to uh, Meadowside Road, which would collect any of that overflow that comes in through there, allow it to get into the trench drain system, and then we're running a pipe system down Meadowside Road, which will tie into an existing catch basin um, a little bit further down, down to the southeast um, through, through that area. Uh, the remainder of the site is going to be served by all underground utilities. We've got the sanitary sewers available to us on Meadowside Road. Um, those connections have been depicted on the drawings. Um, all the other utilities, water will be underground. The uh, gas electric will also be all underground also. Uh, Mr. Gordon has also provided um, a rather detailed uh, landscape and lighting plan, uh, which is shown on sheet SP5 of your drawing. We've got that highlighted here. This is on a little bit col colored up sheet here. So you can see we've got, uh, Mr. Gordon has prepared a number of plantings uh, for, for the area um, for the development. Uh, we've also, uh, typically what comes up in, in these applications also, there's questions with regards to what are we doing with snow removal and things along those lines. Um, we do have uh, a relatively large snow shelf area to the western portion of the property just outside the paved parking area as well as the, the uh, green strip that's over uh, adjacent to the uh, driveway entrance and through there. Um, so with that, I think that pretty much sums up uh, the main components of the site plan for the project. Uh, I believe Mr. Gru is here to go over the architecturals um, and he'll, he'll give you a little bit more insight as to the actual uh, layout of, of the units and the, uh, and the setup of those. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Milton Gregory Grew. I'm a licensed architect. My practice, Grew Design Incorporated, is on Main Street in Woodbury. And I am the, the project architect for uh, 335 Meadowside. And um, the, the architectural design is relatively simple in that they are three-story townhouses. The um, townhouses are grouped with three townhouses per building. Uh, so that we uh, try to avoid as much as possible that sort of railroad style appearance. On sheet uh, A101 of the architecturals, we have the, uh, the first floor plans of the buildings. Uh, in all cases, except for one unit, uh, they all have a, a single car garage on the first level with uh, some storage space, mechanical and uh, laundry space, along with their entry. Uh, to the unit and stairs going to the two upper levels. On sheet A102,
we have the two typical uh, second floor plans for the buildings and essentially they have an open living dining area and, and kitchen on that level with a half bath and then the stairs going up to the third floor. And on the third level, uh, depending on whether or not they are a uh, one bedroom townhouse or two bedroom townhouse, they either have two bedrooms on that level or, or one bedroom uh, with an open loft at the top of the stairs that has no privacy, it's just a wide open space when you get to the, the top of the stairs and then there's a full bath at that floor. On the uh, 200 sheets, 201 through 205, we show the, the variations basically in the, uh, in the elevations of the units. And essentially what we're trying to do by having only one of the entry doors on the, the front of the building, give it sort of a, a symmetrical appearance uh, that makes it look almost like a single building and then have uh, just the, the two flanking townhouses have their entrances on, on the side so we don't have three doors in a row. Um, as you can see, it's just basically uh, with um, vinyl siding and architectural roof shingles using hip roofs and gables uh, to some variation that we're just trying to keep it a very uh, simple, straightforward, uh, traditional residential design. Uh, with respect to the uh, fire safety of the units themselves, these buildings uh, must comply with the 2009 International Residential Building Code um, as adopted by the state of Connecticut and amended by the state. And so all the structural requirements and the, um, the fire resistance uh, between the units is it will be a, a two-hour fire separation wall that would uh, go right from the foundation all the way up through the attic space to the, to the roof sheathing uh, of the units so that they're completely separated from each other. Uh, you have in your files a, a letter of review from the um, fire marshal dated January 15th in which uh, he recommended that um, a fire sprinkler system be installed in the townhouses uh, to meet a standard known as NFPA 13D. And uh, it's not a code requirement, it's not required in the state of Connecticut, but it is an option in the state building code and the res residential code to use that particular uh, sprinkler system. And, uh, and so the, the developer uh, sent a letter to the, the fire marshal indicating that, uh, of course, we'd be willing to, uh, to provide that system in these units. And so they, uh, they will employ that, which will be a, a huge upgrade in fire safety uh, for this construction. Uh, with respect to energy conservation, all of the units have to meet a very stringent uh, level of energy conservation, and that's known as the 2009 International Energy Conservation Code. And um, if any of our houses that we're living in today are built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, this is going to these the construction here will be miles ahead of us uh, with respect to its energy efficiency. And uh, if you have any questions about the architecture, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. We'll ask questions at the end. Okay. Good evening, Chairman and Commission members. My name is David Spear. I'm the Principal Engineer with DLS Traffic Engineers in Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, I have 30 years of experience in traffic engineering and I'm a registered uh, professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. We were asked to look at this application from a traffic point of view. Um, the application, as it was indicated earlier, is for 18 townhouse units. We uh, selected for our study area three intersections, Meadowside Road at Eldred Drive, Meadowside Road at Great Meadow Drive, Meadowside Road at the Site Drive. These intersections were selected based on the proximity to the Site Drive, and the intersections away from these, 
this area are not relevant to this application because of the size of the application. The trip generation based on Institute of Traffic Engineers trip generation rates is 13 to 15 trips per peak hour. And using ITE guidelines and ITE and, and, and DOT rule of thumb, which is an intersection is not uh, typically impacted if it has 100 or less trips from the proposed development in hitting that intersection. So once you get away from the site drive, all of the intersections have less than 100 trips because our trip generation is, is 15, which is far under the, the threshold for the selection of intersections. So our study area was selected just because we needed the proximity of the intersections to the site drive intersection. Meadowside Road has a daily traffic of 6,200 vehicles per day based on the 2012 measurements from the DOT. The AM peak hour traffic, which we measured, was 421 trips, and the PM peak hour was 774 trips. These are moderate volumes for, based on traffic engineering standards and uh, do not represent a significant or a high traffic area. The, the uh, Eldred Drive and Great Meadow Drive roads had 24 vehicles or less during peak hours. Those are basically cul-de-sacs with very few uh, peak hour trips. The accident history um, we obtained from the DOT was from uh, January 2011 to December 2013. The DOT had no accidents in our study area, which was within 400 feet in each direction from the site drive intersection. We also got accident data from the Milford Police Department, which indicated there were two accidents within the 400-foot uh, study area from the site drive intersection. The, um, the, police, the Milford Police Department accidents were not directly on Meadowside Road, but we're in an adjacent parking area, so they, they really weren't uh, part of the Meadowside Road history, and they also were, were not injury accidents. They were property damage only. The intersection site distance, which is, is a key safety factor for this um, application, was measured at over 400 feet in each direction from the site drive location, the proposed site drive. The speed limit is 25 miles per hour, and the uh, observed travel speed was 35 miles per hour. So we, um, the 400-foot site distance was adequate for the existing posted speed limit and for the observed travel speeds. So we didn't see any problem with, with the sight lines. The um, townhouse units generate during the uh, morning peak hour, 13 trips based on the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual, 13 trips in the morning for townhouse units, that's two entering and 11 exiting, and 15 in the afternoon, that's 10 entering and five exiting. That traffic was applied to uh, Meadowside Road and to the study intersections based on uh, existing travel patterns, we added the site traffic into the uh, background numbers. The capacity analysis at the study intersection showed level of service B or better at uh, all intersections during both peak hours. There's, uh, there's no capacity issues. We're talking about an amount of traffic that, that is less than the uh, variance from hour to hour in, in traffic, the 13, uh, to 15 trips is, is a very small amount of traffic, so it has no impact at the uh, site drive intersection or the adjacent intersections, and upstream and downstream from our site would have no impact. In conclusion, we found there were no accident trends that would be impacted by the site-generated traffic 
The reason we look at the accident history is to see if there are any accident trends that would be uh, impacted by site traffic, like if, if there were a bunch of rear end accidents or um, turning accidents related to the operation or uh, the geometry of the roadway, we would recommend improvements for safety to uh, offset any accident data. But the, the accidents at the site drive intersection uh, show no trends. The s intersection site distance is good for the posted and observed travel speeds. The levels of service were B or better at all the study intersections and there's no significant impact on safety or traffic impacts. The, um, I believe you got a, a study or some comments from a, uh, an opposing traffic engineer, a Kermit Hua, which uh, is critiquing our traffic study. He had main, two, two main uh, points in his traffic study was the uh, scope of the study area, which was the, the number of intersections we looked at. He was indicating that we should, we should add five additional intersections to the study area, which doesn't make any sense because our traffic is so small that it's not impacting those, those exterior intersections. We're, uh, we're talking about 13 to 15 peak hour trips and those are only relevant at our site drive. Once we get away from the site drive, they're not significant. When you get to the, the bigger intersections with larger volumes, they become such a small component, they would, they would have no impact. And uh, he also has a section on accident records. Um, the accident records upstream and downstream on Meadowside Road are not um, relevant to what we're doing and what we're proposing with the site drive. The, uh, the impacts and the trends that we look for are, are at the immediate site drive area and in the vicinity of the uh, sight line approach distances to the, to the intersection, which is the 400 feet approaches on either direction. So all of those uh, accident records, which, which he really doesn't provide any detailed accident records, there, there's some uh, names listed, but the type of accident or, or anything that's usable is not provided. Um, as far as the driveway location, the, the uh, intersections in this area are primarily cul-de-sac intersections with very low volume uh, traffic on them as documented by our traffic study so that the, uh, the influence of our additional driveway to the existing driveways is not going to be a problem. So I think those cover most of the uh, issues that it, he raised in his comments, and I'll be available to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Chairman, I think it would be appropriate at this time if the board members have any questions, they can be directed. Uh, that's the uh, conclusion of uh, our evidence into the record. Thank you. Any comments from staff? Uh, you have uh, my staff report uh, in front of you. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the design uh, of the uh, sidewalks and driveways uh, at units N, O, and P. Uh, if you look at, uh, you can use the handout that was given to you tonight. If you turn to the second page, it shows you the, uh, the landscape uh, and a site plan layout. Uh, you will see that uh, access, pedestrian access, to units N, O, and P are from the driveway of unit N. Uh, this is highly unusual. I've, I haven't seen a development uh, in uh, our city where we have something like this. Uh, the developer tells me, the applicant tells me, that uh, there will be uh, no parking in front of unit N, uh, and that would be the solution to that. Uh, I find that uh, very unreasonable uh, because all it takes is a uh, car to park in front of unit N and you've blocked access uh, into uh, unit N, O, and P. Uh, a solution to this, uh, a very simple solution to this would be to get rid of unit O. And if you got rid of unit O, 
N can uh, be entered from its own driveway, and the sidewalk going into unit P uh, can be reconfigured to come around to its own driveway. Uh, if the applicant has some other way of, uh, of uh, redesigning this that, you know, gives, you know, access that is not uh, hindered and blocked uh, by, uh, by parking into three units, you know, that would, that would be fine as well. But as it stands now, I think that's, uh, that's a hazard uh, in that uh, you cannot walk into those units uh, if a vehicle is parked in unit N. And to say that uh, uh, you'll just prohibit parking in that area is, is unreasonable uh, knowing human nature. Other than that, the rest of the project uh, I have no issue with. Can I respond to that? Sure. Right. The, way, the way that this was designed was, as David had pointed out, I believe, you, Unit O doesn't have a garage. So Unit N has a garage and a parking space in front of it. And I think a simple solution to the entire problem would be to eliminate the garage as well in N. And those two units then could utilize the parking that is on the west side of the property. But I think it's unreasonable to request that uh, the, the unit actually be eliminated when, in fact, on site there's plenty of proper, uh, there's plenty of parking to accommodate the 18 units. Yeah, that that's a design, that's also a design solution. As long as there's uh, no. Uh, driveway going into unit N because there'd be no parking in unit N, then you can have those uh, sidewalks coming out, you know, into the uh, main uh, parking area. It should be done in such a way where uh, they won't get blocked by unit M, uh, which is next to unit N. Right. When we were talking about this today, we came up with that as a proposed stipulation. So I will put that on the record. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Mr. Nickel. Yeah, I have a few questions here. Um, I'm concerned about the overflow that was pointed out when the retention system storage fills up and the water runs down Meadowside Road. Why would it fill up and how are you running it down Meadowside Road? See if I could clarify that a little bit better. On sheet S or SP3 of your drawings, which is the grading plan, that, that basically shows all of our drainage that's, that's taking place in through here. So what, so what you have, again, you have the concrete pavers are located in through this area here. And as we pointed out, we've got zero discharge for up to the 25-year storm. Everything stays within the system. So on those rare occasions when you have greater than a 25-year storm and you have some water that might be sheet flowing out through, through the area, um, it's all intercepted by a trench drain across, across the throat of the driveway. So anything that's coming out through this system is going to get intercepted by that trench drain. The water gets collected in that, and then it's going to be discharged through a proposed pipe, uh, which is going to travel in a south uh, uh, northeasterly direction along Meadowside Road and tie into the existing catch basin uh, located approximately um, 160 to 180 feet away from the property. So you're gonna you're gonna install that pipe along the curb line, or where is that pipe? No, it's going, going it's going under our proposed sidewalk, and uh, we're actually gonna uh, it'll be installed underneath the sidewalk all the way down. So as part of the proposal, the sidewalks will be replaced from. Uh, the, the approximate location of that catch basin all the way up to the site area. And what's at the end of that proposed pipe? At the end of the proposed pipe is, a catch, is an existing catch basin. And where does the catch basin go? Uh, catch basin picks up all the drainage from Meadowside Road and continues uh, 
down to the low point, which I'm not sure exactly where that is, but it continues in a downhill hill direction. Thank you. I have another question for you, sir. Okay. How many inches of rain does it take to fill up that retention, the first retention from the buildings? Well, with, uh, to utilize the full capacity, again, I'd have to go back into the report, but just off the top of my head, because we're, we're basically going for a 25-year storm, so it's going to be probably around 5.1 inches of rainfall. Any further questions from the board? Mr. Quish. Uh, question. Um, if, say, you know, we talked about potential impact on the school system and so, you know, acknowledging the potential for children to be in the, uh, in the development, um, if they, how will they get to the sidewalk to, out on the street to walk to the school? Will they walk down the, to, through the parking lot? Is that the plan? I don't understand your question. Oh, so if there are children on the site and they're going to walk out to the sidewalk yeah. on Meadowside Road, Correct. do they walk in the middle of the, uh, the parking lot? Is that, the, is that the plan? They would walk out of their unit and walk to the sidewalk. Yeah. If they're going to walk, I'm not familiar, familiar with the area as to the extent of the sidewalk up Meadowside. I mean, that's quite a walk up to but so, Stevens oh, okay. Lane. So I, I, I guess I'm just observing that there's no sidewalks to direct pedestrian traffic through this site. So they would walk through the parking lot to get to the okay. sidewalk. So I would say that that's potentially dangerous. Um, and I notice also that there is um, no, uh, no real green space. If you anticipate children, there's, there seems to be no uh, no area for children to play or to be outside in there. Well, first of all, there is a public park right nearly adjacent to the property on the other side of Siemens. The ba you're talking about Luke the baseball field? field, and I think that there's a playground yeah. there. Right. Any further questions, Mr. Grant? Uh, not really such a question. Uh, in looking at Mr. Quish's uh, question about children and areas to play, there is a, you know, there is a concern with the, uh, the last three units, O, N, and M. Is there any thought about eliminating those and opening up more of a green space on, on the site? Well, again, the short answer is the proposal before you is, is what it is. It's up to you to consider it. And, uh, uh, again, the sight lines, I mean, the setbacks and the uh, uh, lot coverage and all those considerations were taken into uh, effect on the plan itself and under the statute, uh, the normal zoning setback and open space uh, requirements don't pertain to these applications. Mr. Mead. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I too have the issue with apartments N and O. If, like you said, if we eliminate the garage on N yes. and, and put the park in down the other across the way, right? You know, when it, it, you know, for two things. One is that uh, the space at where the garages would be would that be maintained just as storage? And two about people the, bring the answer know. the answer to that would be yes it would right. not and be an improved place uh, improved uh, space and secondly it would be landscaped in front there right and then also um, about people coming home you know i mean people moving in they wouldn't have uh, access to a driveway to use or dropping off people or groceries and stuff and if they use the driveway in m then they're blocking that people it's just going to be more congestion in that corner, and I so I would think that there would be some other way we could work those two units to make it easier. And David's comment was actually looking for a reconfiguration, so that if there is a condition that's placed on an approval that that needs to be addressed, it can be addressed. My other response to you is again. In close proximity, you have the Meadowside Apartments, you have the Oyster Bay converted apartments with large parking lots. People come out of their apartments and they just walk to the, their car in a parking lot. They don't have a designated driveway area in front. They don't have a garage. So that, 
you know, I think what's been provided on site here is is uh, v fairly uh, amenable to, uh, you know, providing the access that you're talking about, but with David's concerns that he raised, I mean, I don't want to get into an argument with him here on a public forum, but I mean, there's plenty of sp instances across the city of Milford where two single-family residences are across from each other with driveways. They both come out to a fairly narrow city street, and you have to look in your rearview mirror and make sure you're not backing out in the road when the person across the street is backing out. I mean, that's basically the problem that exists here that, that David's raising. So our short answer at first blush was, well, we don't think it's a problem because if somebody's pulling out of a garage and he sees the guy diagonally across is pulling out as well, you stop and wait for the other person to go. But uh, ju just for clarification, that's the lesser of my concerns. My concern is if a car is actually parked in N, you cannot walk and use that sidewalk that goes to N, O, to go to or o. P. Okay. I... So in response to that, we looked at it this afternoon. We, we got your memo this morning, so we tried to address it for tonight's public hearing. Our response to it is to eliminate the parking in front of those two units and have the parking over in the, uh, the area along the west side of the property. And there are plenty of examples of that across town. The one that comes to my mind immediately is Caswell Cove uh, condominiums. Some of the units there have garages, some of them don't, and the parking for the units that don't have garages are across the parking lot. Thank you. Mr. Nickel. Yes, in the, uh, in the traffic concern, I didn't see anything in here that indicated summertime and Silver Sands traffic. Our counts were done in June. No, no, hold on. Yeah, our counts were done in June of uh, 2013, and uh, that's right at the beginning of the summer period. But the uh, the the point of the traffic study and the and and the impact of this development is the amount of traffic we're generating, which is very small. We're, we're a, a 13 to 15, 13 to 15 peak hour trips. And if you, if you had 10 or 20% more background traffic, we would just be a smaller component of the overall traffic. We, we still are not gonna be an impact to the roadways or the uh, background traffic. So the summertime, adjustment if there were to be one which which typically is 10 or 20 percent would would be uh, would not significantly change to the results of our traffic study we would still expect to get good levels of, good levels of service and we would have no significant impact from this development I live in Milford and I don't use I use Meadowside when I leave Silver Sands because I can't get to the post road in a timely manner. And a lot of people in Milford use Meadowside to go home. People out of town, they don't know that area, so they go out to the post road. And I'm sure there's a tremendous impact during the summer months from Silver Sands that are not indicated in here. That impact would be an, an impact that the uh, Meadowside traffic would have on our development, not vice versa. Our traffic is a handful of vehicles. It's 15, 15 peak hour trips. So that we are not impacting that traffic. If that traffic increases and you have more people using it during the summer, we become a smaller component of the overall traffic. We're not, we're not a significant generator regardless of what happens in the background condition. Thank you. 
Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, we will open this up for public comment. Again, I will go over the procedure. If you could please approach the podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your name for the record. Address all comments to the commission. If your comments have been previously presented, please refrain from repeating. State your comments in a clear and succinct manner, and please try to keep your comments under three minutes. If you're in favor of the application, please come to the podium. Good evening. My name is Marcy Pitney, and I currently live at 229 West Main Street in Milford. I am here, and I am the single mother that Attorney Lynch referred to um, earlier, and I am here because I am the face of affordable housing. I um, was born and raised in Orange, um, moved to Milford 19 years ago. I have two children. I have a daughter who is in college and a 16-year-old son who currently resides with me. Um, I was married for 25 years, and um, unfortunately, I am now a single mother, um, having gone through a divorce, and was not sure where I was going to live. My house is currently up for sale, um, and my main concern was keeping my son, who's still attending school in Milford, in the education system that he has gone through since kindergarten and is now a, a sophomore at Jonathan Law. Um, and if it wasn't for the opportunity that I was given through affordable housing, I am not sure where I would be right now. And um, I'm the face of affordable housing. I'm a 50-year-old single mother, college educated, and did not know where I was going to go. And I consider myself extremely uh, fortunate to have been given this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in favor of the application? Seeing no one else, if you're opposed to the application, you could come to the podium. Hello, my name is Frank Janice, G-I-N-I-S-E. If it's okay, I'd like to Come up there and hand out some papers. Just please state your address for the record. 331 Meadowside Road. If I may, I'd like to go through a quick background of 335 Meadowside. In 2010, my wife is a single divorced mom with two kids, um, was approached by the Fields Brothers with a realtor and they say you may want to consider selling because we are going to put a low, low income housing in front of you. My wife refused. She closed the door on them. In 2010 they tried to subdivide uh, and put two houses in there. Um, in volume 27 planning zoning refused this because the back lot was less than an acre. Uh, and I'm trying to abbreviate everything that's there because I know I only have three minutes. The Fields Brothers have had three different families in there. Right now, there's a family with several children. Those pictures that I brought up show what the house looks like. The house wasn't always like that. When Miss Fisher was there, the original owner, she kept it up, and that's an older woman. These gentlemen have let it go. As you can see, the pictures show that the fence is falling down. There's piles of brick in the yard. The front stairs are falling apart, bricks on it. And again, 
no railings with three kids, or excuse me, four kids in the house. As for other issues, the increased uh, congestion on the road, I live there. In the summer, when Silver Sands is open, I'm sitting in my driveway five minutes waiting for cars to go by so I can get out on it. And I appreciate that they looked into it There's, or from 2012. This is 2015 coming on 16. There's a lot more vehicles, a lot more stuff going on there. Uh, there's no overflow parking. That's great that they have parking for two people in there, two cars. What happens when somebody has a party, a birthday, a holiday? What's going to happen with those cars? Are they going to be parking on the street? Are they going to be in my driveway? Are they going to be on Eldridge, where right now you have people overflow parking there where they're not supposed to? Um, also, for the school, children walking, there's always kids on that street. They're riding bikes, they're on skateboards, they're going to the beach. And as for the school part of that, great. That's again 2012 they were talking about and the drop. If you look through school records, that's constantly changing. As a generation goes by, kids will drop off. The next generation, it fills back up. Uh, fire and zone. Zone regulations regarding approximate adjacent properties. They're suggesting that instead of the 10 foot that is planning and zoning for our area, R12 individual homes, they want to be eight feet and nine inches from my property line in the back corner. That might not bother some. And I know this is under 830G, but that's my home. That's close to my house. If there's a fire, that's my house, my trees that are going to catch on fire, and my family behind it. Um, I'd like to also address, they said there's a snow shelf. If anyone's been here in the last couple of years with all the snow we have, I have a 400 foot long driveway, just a single driveway. And we have no place to put it after, say, the third or fourth plow. I'm kind of wondering where they're going to put it and how that's going to end up happening with all the runoff from that to where it's going to go later on. Um, there's also the fire chief has apparently signed off on this. I have a paper up there that you've gotten from. Um, Joe Versus versus Associates, who has the 2015 uh, changes on it. This is a road states that has to have, can go no farther than 150 feet into it with a fire truck. They're suggesting that this is not going to be a road, that this is going to be a driveway. A driveway usually doesn't have a 1836 parking spots on it. That's usually a parking lot or considered a road. That truck has to be no further than 150 feet from what the understanding is and be able to turn around and come out with no problem. If you've seen anyone with any type of fire or a heart attack, somebody falls and gets hurt, a kid gets hurt, you have a fire truck, an ambulance, and usually a medical car and a cop car that shows up. There's no, re no area for these vehicles to be in there. There is a turnaround at the very end of it that won't will not handle this flow. Um, also, uh, they have spoken about putting fire sprinklers in here. I can't say whether that's going to work or not. I know it's not in this state mandatory they're going to do it. However, the Fields brother who they had stated put in the West Main Street and people are now living there. Well, they still haven't put in the fire hydrant that they promised. That's still waiting. And that's per the fire, mar uh, fire chief. He said that was never put in. Also, the fire chief has stated in writing on several documents that with all these different 830Gs coming up, we are going to have to look into more fire department um, for labor, the police department and more equipment to handle these things. I look at this and I see not just my house behind it. I see my neighbors who have 
runoff water as it is in their backyard and can't mow their lawns till sometimes early June. They're talking about setting this in process with drainage. Okay, what's gonna happen to the water table when they put this there and we already have yards that are flooding? If that changes the water table, who's gonna be responsible for that? Who's gonna pay for that? I know I'm not going to. And people do have sump pumps in the area. Um, and another thing that's gonna bother us all there is we are R12, single family homes. Most of us are ranches, a few capes here and there. Noise, the lighting, having all this trash there. They're saying put in, they're gonna put rubber made garbage things on the side of the house. Who's going to deal with this? Who Are we having a truck back in at 6 in the morning to pick these up? The noise from that. Again, some of this is emotion because I'm there, but all this is safety to me. You're going to have kids there. Are they going to come out while a garbage truck is going through? These kids, if you fill them up, as you said, where are they walking through? A parking lot with 36 parking spaces? and cars coming out and going to work, going to school. Anyhow, um, I hope that you take this into serious consideration. It's not that I'm against affordable housing. You do need affordable housing in Milford and every other town. The fact is, is that the Fields brothers purchased a piece of land that they couldn't get their houses on, which they thought they could do. And the government here saw right to refuse it in 2010. Now they're going to try to go in under 830G and stick 18 units in less than an acre area and manipulate all the laws. If they really want to do affordable housing and help town of Milford, city of Milford, buy areas that can take care of this areas that are open. These are only gonna have 10 feet from the back to the property line. Where are these kids gonna be? In my yard? Walking the streets? Playing in the, the parking lot? This isn't an area that it should be in. That's all I really got to say on it. And I thank you for your time. Also, um, I have our traffic engineer, Kermit Kwa, that will address any of the traffic things, and I would like him to speak to. Thanks, Frank. Uh, again, my name is Kermit Hua, K-E-R-M-I-T. Last name is H-U-A. Uh, my practice is a KWH Enterprise LLC, located at 277 Reservoir Avenue, R-E-S-E-R-V-O-I-R. Suite 1101, Meriden, Connecticut, 06451. Um, Frank asked me to look at the, uh, the traffic study for this development and also do a general review of the traffic operation uh, of the area. I looked at, at the uh, traffic study by Mr. Spears. Um, as you might expect, you know, I have some disagreement. I did submit, I think Mr. Janice did submit my letter to the commission, so I won't go through everything in detail. I just want to go through some of the main points. Uh, first of all, my qualification. Uh, I'm a registered professional engineer in seven states, including the state of Connecticut, and a registered professional traffic operations engineer nationally. Uh, I have 18 years of experience in traffic engineering. Uh, first, my first disagreement with Mr. Spear is the scope of this study. Um, at tonight's hearing, uh, Mr. Spear quoted uh, DOT, Department of Transportation Practice, you know, how many trips warrant to you study specific intersection. What I want to point out is, you know, first, we are not at a DOT now. Second is, you know, although I haven't read through the uh, zoning regulation, I think most towns wouldn't allow DOT requirements to override uh, local zoning regulations. 
The third is just the context of the development. If you think about it, Department of Transportation, they deal with major thoroughfares and freeways. And here, Meadowside Road, we are not talking about I-95. We are not talking about Boston Post Road. So you need to be sensitive to the specific design context, specific neighborhood when you look at a traffic impact. And if you drive through Meadowside Road, I, I assume most of you do, you know, it is overwhelmingly single family residential uh, neighborhood. So accordingly, your scope of traffic study, your criteria to verify, uh, to uh, judge whether an intersection should be included in the study should be sensitive to the context of that uh, location. So what I pointed out in the letter is, you know, at least five major intersections should be included in the study because those are pretty busy intersections, especially uh, during the afternoon peak hours when people come back home. Uh, specifically, you know, Meadowside Road and Seaside Avenue, Robert Tree Parkway, that's the second. The third is Silver Sands Parkway, which is located about, I, I would say, four, four to 500 feet away from this site. It's not that far away. It has a signal control. As the commission member pointed out, you know, during the summertime, it's a mess. I mean, you have all those people go to the beach. Uh, and also, further, further west, you have Pumpkin Delight Road, and further west, you have the intersection of Meadowside and Meadows End Road. You know, these all are all important inter intersections people use every day. You know, I know, uh, you know, we have Sikorsky here in the neighborhood. Probably some people work for Sikorsky, live in the area, but I don't think people actually go to work in helicopters, right? They, eventually, they will have to drive through all these roads on Meadowside Road. I don't think it's um, too much to ask to look at these five key intersections that are busy, that are constricted as far as their capacity, that are deficient as far as the traffic accident experiences. Uh, I don't think it's a, a appropriate to leave that out of the traffic study. So that's the main point about the scope of the uh, study. The second is accident records. You know, I really didn't do much to come up with 550 accident records. I just, what I did is just go to the town police department website and they have a button say you can, you can search accidents just based on the road name. I put in Meadowside Road and give me 50 most recent accidents. You know, that's from 2012 to 2015, a little bit over three years. Uh, again, Meadowside Road is not a long roadway. You know, we're talking about two, three miles, you know, 50 accidents. Uh, it's, it's a bit of concern, especially if you look at where those accidents occurred. You know, out of those, I, I, I counted 31 of those 50 accidents occurred at those five key intersections, at those 50 intersections that currently experience congestion during peak hours. So it's very difficult to make an argument to say the project's going to have no impact to these intersections uh, with regard to capacity and the traffic safety. Uh, of the general traveling pub public. And the third point I want to make is about the driveway location. You know, in traffic engineering, usually it's not preferable to locate a driveway in the immediate vicinity of an intersection, especially a driveway with relatively high volumes, such as this 18-unit development. Um, the problem we have here is we have a T-intersection of a Meadowside Road and Great Meadow Drive, which is a T intersection. It's, I don't know how far, it's immediately west of the proposed driveway. So, you know, when people say, let me give you an example. Say if you have a people emerging from Great Meadow Road, want to make a right turn, what do you look? They only look to the right. In other words, they only look at uh, traffic that's emerging from the west through traffic. If there's a gap, they're going to make a right turn. But when you have a driveway so close to that intersection, most likely those right turn driveways, they didn't notice there's another, dri another driver waiting to get out of this driveway from the 18 units. The same thing for these, a driveway exiting the driveway, for, for the driver exiting the driveway from this development is, they only look at to the right. In other words, look, they only look at through movements on Meadowside Road. They don't look at 
drivers emerging from gray metal road. So that's the issue we are dealing with here. You have a lot of conflicts when you locate a major driveway so close to an existing T intersection. Uh, you know, to me, you know, just by the location of this uh, driveway and the site in relation to the uh, Great Meadow Road intersection, it is inherently unsafe from a, from a traffic standpoint to locate this kind of dense development on this site. Um, I think I pretty much covered everything. Uh, if the commission has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is William Healy, H-E-A-L-E-Y. I live at 37 West Shore Drive. Um, a number of years ago, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals denied uh, the construction of two units on this property as overuse of the property. Uh, now 18 units are being proposed for the site. It sounds like they're going in the wrong direction here. Uh, if, two wasn't, if two was too much, 18 is not less. A couple of environmental concerns. I live uh, approximately 100 yards away from this parcel, and the water table in my backyard is about 8 feet below grade, and I know this because I uh, had it tested last fall for another reason. Each spring, I watch the water run out of the yards of my neighbors across the street from me who abut the property being uh, proposed here. The question of uh, how deep is the water table on this property, and are there any natural springs in the property, and has anyone checked into this to see if the water table or if there's natural springs on this property? Uh, the question of where the water will run off into the roof gutters and leaders is going to be onto, already, uh, onto property that's already water soaked. And uh, once the property is paved over, where will that water additional go? The gentleman's explained some of it. If the owner's already concerned about water runoff, that's, uh, why have they incorp uh, incorporated a permeable entrance to the driveway to try to disperse this water, the water runoff from the property? I'd like to address a couple of public safety questions. Uh, I have a little experience in this. The uh, first two apparatus to this property is called a quint, which is a combination of pumper truck and ladder truck. And this piece of apparatus is longer than a standard fire engine due to having an aerial device mounted on it. It also requires a larger footprint because, the aerial, uh, because of having the aerial on it, it has to extend outriggers to the side to balance the apparatus when the aerial is raised. As this is a three-story building, the use of the aerial would be required almost every time. The tower truck, the large aerial apparatus in Milford, will be unable to enter the property if any apparatus are already on the site in the confined parking area. The length of the tower truck is 43 feet long, and it requires an approximately 27-foot wingspan to set out its outriggers in this small parking. With the close proximity of the proposed buildings and instructing them on the property lines, there will be no access to the rear of these three-story buildings for emergency operations. Is there enough room in this small parking area for multiple emergency vehicles, like in a medical emergency situation? And if there's any snow pile up in this property, will emergency access be compromised? With guest vehicles, potential dumpsters, and other vehicles on a property, emergency access will be nearly impossible. With sprinklers installed in this property, I congratulate the builder. But sprinklers are meant to be, keep the fire in check so that the occupants can escape, not to extinguish the fire. That's the job of the fire department. And these being wood frame buildings with trust construction, it will be very difficult to access and extinguish any substantial fire in these buildings. Another question, is there enough water pressure in the system to sustain the sprinkler system and to provide water for firefighting purposes? Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Rob Willix, W-I-L-L-O-X. I live at 34 Elgid Drive, right around the corner. Uh, we have a wonderful little neighborhood, the street, 11, 11 homes on the street. I moved there 31 years ago, and I'm still in the minority as far as seniority on the street, okay? Um, we have a lot of residents there, have been there a long time. Uh, since I've been there, we've had a lot of change in the environs right around us. Um, the Jago Senior Center went in. <clears throat> um, the 
Iroquois gas pipeline went in, it's about 50 yards behind my house. Um, as a matter of fact, I went to the hearing for that, and they showed these wonderful vistas of how they maintain uh, the property where the gas pipeline would go. But if you've ever driven down Silver Sands Parkway, you can see the lie there. Uh, Silver Sands Parkway and the development of the park. Um, we've already had a lot of constriction um, with these things. We got Stop and Shop went in. Um, used to be able to see the northern uh, constellations uh, at night, not so much anymore with the lighting. Uh, I just seem to think that uh, we've already given to the greater good quite a bit in this little section of Milford, and I don't really see the need for this particular unit. Thank you. Hello, members of the Zoning Board. My name is Sharon Riley. My husband and I live at 24 West Shore Drive. It's R-E-I-L-L-Y. -L I want to thank you for the time and effort you put into your job, and I ask that you put a lot of consideration. All of this has an impact on us. Financially, these units, if they're built, we would suffer financial loss because people are not interested in purchasing a home with apartments right in their backyard. We've had three houses on our street for sale in the last six months, and they have had already um, lost um, sales on those ho houses because of uh, the prospect of more apartments. We already have apartments uh, in back of us with um, the Meadowside condos, and people have lost um, the idea of selling those homes because of different things like that. They've gone from being worth somewhere around 325 to being worth somewhere around 274. That's a big deduction. Um, also in the financial area, Milford is in the process of sending out new tax reassessments. We answered the questionnaire, proud of what we own, willing to do our share. They're going to reassess, most likely raise our rates, and at the same time, the value of our home is going down. This is not right. Paying higher taxes for a home that's losing value and enjoyment is not right. And looking at the Milford community, especially the West Shore area, we have multifamily units all over the place. Meadowside, Oyster Bay, DeMeo, Jago, Robert Treat, all within a half a mile of us. Um, why should there be more complexes built around us, build multifamily complexes on bigger pieces of property in other areas of Milford that are not as densely populated? With regards to environmental issues, we have water problems already. Our yard becomes so saturated we cannot mow the backyard at times. The water problem has worsened since the driveway behind us was paved and water runs over the pavement and then floods our backyard. More building certainly means more problems. We're contemplating purchasing solar for our home. It's a Milford initiative. And um, if we, our backyard goes up a hill like this and then you're putting three-story buildings behind us, we may not have the solar potential that we were expecting to save our, the money to make this beneficial. If these apartments are built in our yard, I want you to see what will happen to our happiness as a family. We have a three-season porch and a deck. We enjoy having breakfast out there in our PJs. Yes, a site we don't want to share. Um, we have a pool, and again, privacy is important to us. Should I not be able to read a book on my deck without the close, close proximity and prying eyes of 18 families? With three-story apartments overshadowing our yard, we will have no privacy. Um, I had a whole section on the, the fire, ambulance, police, fire rescue, snow, uh, trucks, dumpsters, garbage. It's been said. Um, it's important to us, though, that um, it's built in such a way that um, we don't have those issues right behind us. Um, one more thing I would like you to think about. We, as in my neighbors on West Shore Drive and Elgin, bought our houses with this land being single family zoned. Why should we change the atmosphere of our neighborhood because someone wants to make money on our backs? 
Are his wants and dreams more important than what we want and dream? I say no. We chose to live in Milford because it was a lovely town, a well-run government, a great place to raise a family, good people who care about each other. Will this new complex enhance this life in Milford? I think not. Is Milford supporting us, or should we hire lawyers to fight this? Our voices should be enough. Your common sense should be enough. I ask that you give this careful consideration for us and our neighbors, financially, personally, and with safety in mind. Would you want this built in your backyard? I even ask, would you like this built in your backyard? Please vote no. Do not change from single family to multiple family. It's not in Milford's best interest. Thank you for listening. Good evening. My name is John Pagliano. I live on 325 Meadowside Road, the neighbor of this property we're talking about. It's P-A-G-L-I-A-N-O. I had conversations with Mr. Field last time, um, and his comments were that if he couldn't build a second house, he was going to do multifamily. Um, I didn't take it as a threat. I understand he's a builder. I work for a construction company. I understand about building, and I understand the comments of his attorney. But I want to tell you something about the traffic that their traffic expert doesn't know. My wife was struck and hit by a car nine months ago on Meadowside Road. She sustained multiple injuries, head injuries, unconscious, six to seven fractures. She's had surgeries. She just went back to work, and she's still in pain, and she still needs more surgeries. So 18 families is 18 to 36 more cars that we don't need. His lawyer was right. We have a lot of properties there now. We don't need another Meadowside Road with Meadowside Apartments, Oyster Bay, Jago Lane. There's enough there now. And there is also Jago Lane has what they have there now for low income. That's fine. We don't need another one. And it's right next door to me. And by the way, when Rene Fisher lived there, that house never looked like it does now. Mr. Field is showing you his true feelings. He's letting it go to pot. He doesn't care. That's what he's doing. And by the way, there's a fresh water spring that runs underneath that property. You know how I know? Because when they had their driveway paved next door and they unearthed that ground, I saw it. Because there was two wells on that property when Rene Fisher was there. Because I also met her husband. I've been there 30 years. Don't let this go through. Mr. Field's a builder and he'll build on every square inch he wants. Look at what he's built in the, in the 30 years. There's almost no grass, no lawns. A lot of properties, a lot of high rise things he's building. We don't need that on Meadowside. I love my wife. She almost died on that road. I don't want to see another car. She's just walking the dog one night. And the car on Meadowside was trying to beat oncoming traffic. You want to add more traffic to that? Maybe I should just put, put her in some reflective gear then from now on. Because it's just going to get worse, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it's just going to get worse. And it's appalling the way he let that property go. Okay, and the way he speaks to the neighbors and the threats and about we're going to build this, we're going to build that. That's not how you get things done. I work for a contractor, but I thank his attorney and him for giving us a little laughter tonight and also his um, traffic guy because it was very entertaining. Vote no. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, Commission. Uh, Leonard G. Marconi, M-A-R-C-O-N-I. I live on 53 West Shore Drive. When I first moved to Milford some 30 plus years ago, I actually bought a house on Pumpkin Delight Road. Well, it was great because it was a state road and it had to be plowed all the time, so I was able to get in and out to work, but my son was an infant then, and the amount of traffic on that road, I says, I have to go somewhere where less congestion. So I bought a house on West Shore, which is a cul-de-sac on the last house on the right-hand side. And I was fortunate enough to be able to raise my son in a nice, quiet street. Uh, the kids in the neighborhood would cut through my yard to go over to Meadowside School. Uh, they hear the baseball, the little league when the windows were open in the spring. It's just a very homey, safe environment back then. Um, 
With this proposal, uh, you know, what's going to happen? You got two parking spots for 18 units, 36 cars there. Uh, when they're rushing out to go to work, who's putting their mascaras on? Who's texting? Who's not paying attention? What's going to take? One child to get hurt? They constantly walk down that street to go to the school. Uh, summertime with the Little League, and then, like you said, with Silver Sands and the beaches. I'm fortunate to have a seven-month-old grandchild, and she's going to be playing in that cul-de-sac. What happens with the overflow of the guests now? They're going to park on the first side street on the right-hand side. People are going to park there because there's no parking on, that, on the site. Um, they want to have parties. Now I'm going to have drunken drivers on my street pulling down that cul-de-sac to turn around because there's no way out. And I got to worry about my granddaughter playing at the end of my driveway or something. Um, again, overcrowded, an acre lot. I want to thank Frank for all his work that he did. They did a great job uh, countering this proposal. And the neighborhood has really come together, united against this. Uh, it's, just, it's just not fitting in the neighborhood. Let's keep it single family zoning. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Karen Craig, C-R-A-I-G. I live at 43 Elgin Drive. Um, I'm probably one of the people that has seniority on Elgin Drive, as Mr. Willox had mentioned previously. I grew up in Milford. I was born and raised in Milford. My parents had to move from their home at Silver Sands because they put the park in. They moved to Meadowside Road. Next thing you know, there was a road put in to go down to the state park. Um, I got married, we bought a home on Elgin Drive. We moved there in 1976. Since that area has been built, several changes have taken place. And the gentleman over here had mentioned about the different apartment complexes on Meadowside Road. If you go by there and you look at where those complexes are, there is a large piece of property where those apartments were built not a small one acre parcel of land. If these units go in, they will severely impact the values of our property. The neighborhood will no longer be the same. The traffic on Meadowside Road is outrageous at times, and as the other gentleman had stated, there are times when it's five minutes before we can even get out of Elgin Drive. Not only are they going to Silver Sand State Park, they are driving down to Walnut Beach, where it is the public beach for the citizens of Milford. Um, I am strongly against this development, and I really hope that you will consider not voting in favor of it. Thank you. My name is Kathy Aprizese. It's A P R U Z Z E S E. My husband and I, we live on Five Great Meadow Drive. Directly across is 335 Meadowside. Since the Fields brothers had purchased that house, that house is a shambles. There was a tree that fell a minimum of two years ago, and they just they just cleaned it up probably within the last year. Um, the house has never been taken care of, and I heard the attorney say that there's new siding and windows. I'd like to know where. I've never seen siding in their windows on that house. The woman who lived there, she took care of the house the best she could, but ever since the Fields Brothers purchased it, it has definitely gone downhill. Um, so I just find that really appalling that you would say there was siding and new windows. Um, you, the Fields Brothers, are the ones who have put down the value of that house, not the woman who lived there previously. Also, the congestion will be outrageous. We live right on the corner. It's really difficult to get out. It's very noisy, and you're talking about less than an acre and 36 cars. That's unacceptable. I feel that we have a voice in Milford just as much as everyone else, and I hope you oppose this bill. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gwen Bruno. I don't live in the immediate area, but I do live 
in North Duck Gardens. I live at 1 Vincent Street in Milford. I, I want to say off the bat, I'm not against affordable housing. My son is 26. He's college educated. He would like to settle down and start a, you know, get married, start a family with his girlfriend. They're both good kids. They can't afford to live in Milford now. So I'm not against affordable housing. My son couldn't be here tonight because of his work schedule. But I asked him, I said, you know, Dan, you know, you would be a prime candidate for this affordable housing. Would you live? Would you live in this 18 unit complex on one acre? And you know what he said? He wouldn't consider it. And you know why? It's way too dense. This is a already densely populated one family neighborhood with one and two story houses. Yes, we have other complexes. Nothing inside of this of 335 uh, Meadowside Drive. Putting 18 units, 18 units on an acre of land is not helping is not helping people who need affordable housing. This is helping pad the pockets of the builders. This is a slumlord mentality. And many of the other neighbors here have indicated, and I've watched this house. I've watched this house deteriorate over the years. As a matter of fact, I looked up, I've looked up in Zillow. Uh, let me see, according to Zillow, the sale listing on this house to Mr. Field was September 2008. This is what, when Mr. Field, to, uh, the Field brothers took uh, uh, possession, this is what the residence looked like. Fortunately, it doesn't look like this today. There is a falling down port, uh, patio in the backyard with no railing, and children who obviously live here because there are, um, there are children's bikes in the backyard. The, um, <laughs> the landscaping has gone to pot. The uh, lawn has never mowed. Uh, if they are so concerned about children, why aren't they concerned about the children living here? Front stairs are falling apart. They're crumbling. Paint's peeling. Paint chips, children. I, I, I don't know if it's lead-based paint, but it's peeling. Um, front door is broken. The, I don't know what you call it, the mechanism that allows the door to close slowly is hanging. Uh, more peeling paint. Tape across a broken window. Low broken window, child could reach up into it. The house used to have two uh, lanterns at its entrance. One's missing. One again, cracked and broken. I'm going to leave you with these pictures. I moved to Milford in 2000 as a single parent, raised my son on my own, and I know how hard it is to find affordable housing, but I found it. I didn't have an affordable housing unit. I scraped, I saved, I did it on my own. And I did it in large part without any child support. I know how hard it is. I wouldn't live here. When I look for an apartment for my son and I, one of the things I look for is play space for him. 18 units with parking on this acre doesn't afford children any play space. I wonder, if they don't maintain the property now, how are they going to maintain 18 units? Prop property values in the area have gone down, and I drive through this area every day and it gets very, very crowded. And I, I know you live here too. You know, you can get traffic engineers up here. We know, we know what really goes on, and we know what really goes on in the summer. 
with Silver Sands. So I like I like you to I like you to truly seriously consider um, the impact that 18 units on one acre would have. I'm not against a smaller division, a, a, a smaller build, uh, and certainly uh, affordable housing. But 18, 18 units in this area is is a slum nod mentality, and and the pictures prove it out. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Afrizzese, A-P-R-U-Z-Z-E-S-E. -Z -Z -E. I live at 5 Drake Mill Drive. Um, I strongly oppose this development uh, for obvious reasons that were stated all night. I just want to stand up and be counted as asking you to vote no for this project. Thank you. My name is Joseph Rakowski, and I live on 7 Elgin Drive, right adjacent to these units, and uh, P-E-R-K-O-W-S-K-I. And as the gentleman brought earlier about the traffic, what is going to happen to this area if the state gets their way in Silver Sands Park? And a toll road, and they put a toll there. Where is all this excess traffic going to go? The streets around us? How is this going to be controlled? They just park, as it is now, the way to park is, they park in front of our house now. And if they have a party in this unit, and they have silver sands with the excess, where is this all going to go? And that's my term on this. Robert Prakowski, by name, uh, P-E-R-K-O-W-S-K-I, 7 Elger Drive, Joseph's brother. Uh, I'd like to point out our backyard is adjacent to that. I'm concerned with the parking lot over there, the runoff. We have problems now at times where there's puddles between both properties. When that gets paved over, when there's snow melt put, up, snow put there, I'm very concerned what it's going to do. Is it get, it's, I know it's going to be in the yard. Will it end up in our basements? What's going to be done about that? I'm also concerned about the lighting because the parking lot will be on that side too. It'll be shining in our backyards and our bedrooms. I just want to bring that up. And again, I urge you to vote no. Good evening. My name is Lionel Colwell, C O L W E L L. I'm at 17 West Shore Drive. The past few years, we've had pretty harsh winters in this part of the uh, state. 2013, we received 38 inches of snow. It took, most, in that area, there's mostly cul-de-sacs, one way in, one way out. It takes approximately three to four days to get the street plowed. Not only does it take that long to get it plowed, but there's a problem as where to put the snow. When they do get to our street, it requires the city to come down with a payloader and a dump truck to remove the snow because the snow plow has to go down and come back out. There's no place to put the snow. I don't know how wide that driveway is going to be, but you know, 38 inches, have they considered how they're going to remove that snow? Another thing is harsh winters harsh on cars and they create abandoned cars which means that people have a tendency to leave their car stranded abandoned anywhere that's something to be considered for snow removal i plead you vote against this Is there anyone else in opposition to the application? 
Seeing no one, the applicant has a chance to rebut what was said or answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as we've experienced on other applications, these applications do generate a motion. And uh, the statute, as it is written, allows developers uh, basically the opportunity to take property in areas where otherwise multifamily development wouldn't be allowed and to bring applications to you. Uh, as we have done tonight. So I understand the concerns of the neighbors. It's a single family area, but as I said at the outset, there are other multifamily developments in close proximity, and the way that uh, these applications have to be reviewed by you is in the context of weighing the need for affordable housing with concerns that would counter that along the area of public health and safety. Now, we came here tonight with Mr. Spear, who did a detailed traffic and analysis, and the gentleman that came, uh, Mr. Hua, made some comments. Uh, I'm going to leave that to David to address maybe things a little bit more specific. But the important thing is that in Mr. Hua's uh, analysis, he made no traffic counts. He didn't come in with any empirical data. He talked about perhaps other intersections should have been included in the traffic study. Well, Mr. Spear preempt preemptively struck that argument in his presentation to you that his traffic analysis was for what is determined by the Department of Transportation to be relevant data, i.e. traffic counts within proximity to the site. With only 18 units, and I say only 18 because we had other projects that we presented to you over the last few months, such as Big Drive, where there were 257 units, and Mr. Quish raised questions about the dissipation of traffic to outlying intersections from the closer intersections at Big Drive that we were uh, focusing on or West Avenue. In this case, we have 18 units, and our traffic analysis is such that that does not, with a peak traffic count of 15, uh, in the morning, and I believe he said, or 10 in the morning and 15 in the, uh, in the p.m., that is not excessive traffic to be added to the flow of traffic on Meadowside Road. It's interesting that last week, actually two weeks ago, May 12th, uh, the hearing was held in the land use court before Judge Berger on the case Kohlberg LLC versus the Milford Planning and Zoning Board. You're well aware of the Colucci project on Pond Point Avenue. And I've become privy to the oral arguments that were made at that uh, uh, court hearing. And specifically, with regard to traffic, Judge Berger grilled Attorney Woods, your city attorney, when the comment was made by Mr. Woods that the traffic on Pond Point Avenue uh, couldn't handle the Colucci uh, uh, flow, I think it was 28 units, uh, and it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And Judge Berger jumped on that and said, what data has been supplied, and I say the same thing here tonight, what data has been supplied to show that the traffic coming out of 335 Meadowside Road is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? That's not the case. You have a traffic memo from Lieutenant Vaughn that's part of your file where he goes into details of the investigation. And this is the sheet that I'm referencing. It's the police uh, memo that was submitted to Chief Mello. It came from Sergeant Chilla, and it was signed off by uh, Lieutenant Dumas and ultimately signed off by the police commission. And what they talked about was exactly what Mr. Spear used as his empirical data in coming before you tonight with a traffic report. And he concludes that our criteria needed is a volume of motor vehicle uh, traffic in excess of 100 trips per hour entering from minor streets in the area. Elgid and Great Meadow are the minor streets closest streets to the proposed site plan and based on the traffic study completed in 2013 by DLS Traffic Engineering and the projected results for 2016, this requirement would not be met. The volume of traffic measured is less than 50% of that requirement. 
That's empirical data. And the gentleman who came to you tonight with a two-page summary and got up and spoke to uh, uh, basically dispute our traffic expert had no empirical data. He had no studies. He had no traffic counts. So that's key. And I tie that into the comments that Judge Berger made in uh, Superior Court two weeks ago. That's what the court looks at in reviewing these applications. The court has to look at what effect does this application have on public health and, and safety. And we submit to you that this has de minimis impact on the traffic on Meadowside Road. When there's traffic during the summer months, as Tom has brought up, that's not caused by the traffic coming from this site. Our site generates X number of traffic uh, visits, uh, ingress and egress each day. That gets added to the other flow on, this, on Meadowside Road. And the impact from this project is what has to be determined. That, that is really the telling point, and that was the argument that really is the crux of how the Kohlberg case is going to be decided. And I don't want this application to go to Superior Court. I'm just relating to you that that's the standard that a court looks at in terms of analysis. All right? I'd ask, for, I'd ask for a little, little level of respect, if I could. Yes, if everyone could please, if you could please allow the commenters to talk without being interrupted, it's common courtesy. Any, and that goes when you guys talk as well. Um, any questions from the board? I have a question for Mr. Spears. Yes. Why isn't your traffic count stale, being that it's about, what is it, over two years old or almost two years old? Excuse me, can you repeat that? Why isn't your traffic count stale, your analysis? It was, it was done when, in 2013? That's when we were initially uh, asked to review the application and to do the traffic study. But, it, but you would admit that traffic patterns have changed in the two years since you've done Typically, your study. traffic data is... <laughs> Typically, traffic counts have a shelf life of about three years. And we projected our background numbers up to the uh, design year as part of the background traffic. So we... You're missing the whole point of this of this application. The, the traffic impact from 18 units is 13 to 15 peak hour trips. Regardless of the background traffic, whether you put in 20 or 30 percent additional for summer traffic, whether you put in a, the incremental growth, the, the growth in background traffic is 1 to 2 percent per year. Whether you put, whether you do that to the background numbers any change that you make does not change the amount of site traffic that we're generating. We're, we're such a small component of the background traffic that we're not a significant generator, we're not a significant impact, we're not a significant impact at the site drive intersection, and we're not a significant impact at any of the adjacent intersections up and down the road. Well, let me ask you this question. You've been before this board on a number of applications, correct? I've been on a few. Been here on a few applications, yes. Okay. And in each time you were hired by the applicant, correct? Yes. We... Was there ever a time when you were hired by an applicant to do a traffic study where you came back and said that it was unsafe? We've come back and recommended improvements. We, we wouldn't typically come back and say it's unsafe. We would say that in order to address your site traffic, you may need a turn lane, or you may need a signal. You may need some additional uh, mitigation to, to mitigate your traffic impacts. But for the developments that we've done in Milford, they have been very small developments, and they've been very, very small generators, so they have had no significant impacts. So there would be no reason to come back with any uh, mitigation me measures needed. Thank you. And I have a question for the other traffic expert, if he's still here. 
Do you have a professional opinion as to whether the traffic count in 2013 is still good today? I think the burden is on the uh, preparer of the traffic uh, study to demonstrate to the board that hasn't been changed. I don't think they have provided that evidence. I have no way to know wh one way or the other whether traffic has been changed. And could you just succinctly state your opinion as to whether or not you believe in your professional opinion this project will have either a negative or positive impact on the public safety? Well, from traffic accidents, yes. Just because of the, you know, 50 accidents occurred on a very short stretch of roadway that is Meadowside Road. Uh, with increased traffic volumes from this development uh, on a predominantly single family uh, road uh, with 18 units, obviously more traffic, you know, will likely to increase the potential for accidents on Meadowside Road. As far as uh, capacity and the queuing and delays for commuters on uh, Meadowside Road, you know, I stick to my point is really the study itself is deficient. Now, for whatever reason, the applicant doesn't want to discuss all the other intersections, but my point is they are relevant because, you know, not only commute, commuter traffic, but during, like the commission member said, during the summer month, people use Meadowside Road as a, a primary access to the beach. So we do have to look at all the other critical intersections, which are not very far away. In my letter, I pointed out all the five intersections, they are located within a one mile radius of the site. You know, by any measure, that's not a far away, that's not irrelevant, that's relevant. And my experience, you know, I have driven through the area once or twice. I'm not a resident of Milford, and there are queues in, in those uh, key locations. When you look at traffic, so the performance of a road, you look at the key locations, you look at the weak points, you don't sort of cherry pick locations that portray your project in a positive light, which I think is the case of this traffic study. So I stick to my point, you need to include all those intersections. You know, without, I, I like, I agree with the attorney, I don't have any data because I didn't do the count. I'm not the preparer of the traffic engineer. But I think as an applicant coming before the board to justify there's no safety issues, it is their burden to present the case that with all those additional traffic from the 18 units, all those other intersections are, uh, along Meadowside Road will operate, you know, acceptably to the people of Milford. Thank you. And again, with all due respect, no data submitted to support that. And then secondly, we got our hands on this uh, accident uh, summary. First of all, it doesn't say whether they're accidents or infractions or speeding tickets. It doesn't say. But we went through each and every one of them. We actually made a map. And within 400 feet of the site, there's two accidents. From 500 feet to 1,000 feet, 14 from 1,500 feet to 2,013, and over 2,000 feet away from the site, 19. So the majority of the 50 accidents that Mr. Hugh is re talking about are accidents that have taken place basically a half a mile away from the site. And we have the map. We've charted them out with a, a, a blue dot to show each and every one of them and marked his exhibit that he gave to you, his report, uh, with each of these accidents. I'd like to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, sir, you, you could actually, um, you're allowed to rebut the rebuttal, so you could come up and, um, it has to be limited to what was said, so you have to respond to something that was said, but under our procedure, you're allowed to rebut the rebuttal. Okay, a uh, couple things. You stated that the A30G is to bring multifamily dwellings into areas that don't have it. We showed we have four in our area already. So that's not the case here. 
there's already a multi, uh, multi-family there. So um, also uh, concerns they're saying about the not being a lot of traffic and everything. I watch kids on that road on skateboards crossing it. Now, come summer, it gets twice as busy. The fact that they turned around and said they did a speed survey. Well, that's great. Your speed survey was done between um, Siemens Lane and Harkness. And, and I know that because I picked up the cones from that. Excuse me, he's right. Those cones, uh, those surveys on the speed were down by the ball field. Nowhere up next to our house. That was done down by the ball field. So that's, as far as I understand, irrelevant to our area and the fact of where an accident or somebody could get hit. Again, earlier they stated that there was only two accidents within the area and nobody got hurt. Well, that was also a lie. Mr. Pagliano's wife got hurt. She almost died. And um, other than that, uh, I have nothing else to say except the fact that they've showed over and over if they don't care about a single family there with four kids, what's a, a huge piece like that going to do with, say, a bunch of kids and no area to play in, no area to walk to the school bus, no area to accept their driveway? And, um, you know, understand there, there are emotions here. But I have kids. I want my kids to be safe, too. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close the record, any questions from the board? Mr. Nichols. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the uh, last time uh, a perk test was taken on that lot. And when is it available and who's got it? Excuse me, Lenny. You're waiting for him. Just one other question. This would be to Mr. Salkis. Um, Kim Rose sent down testimony. Was that handed out? She had sent it to you, I understand. Pardon? Well, she had said it was sent out yesterday and um, sent to town hall. Uh, from my understanding, when I talked to her the day before, she said it was going to be going to Mr. Sulkis. So if you could look into that, that'd be great. Thank you. The uh, deep test holes and infiltration testing for the stormwater system were conducted in June of 2014. So the city engineer has that? He has all the information on it. It was part, uh, it's, it's all included as part of the stormwater management report. And he had, and that was part of his review. You said that's a deep water hole? There were, there were deep test holes done and infiltration test holes. How deep? The uh, deep test holes were down. Again, I'd have to go back and look at the records. Uh, typically, we go down eight, a minimum of eight feet. Shallow? How shallow? Eight feet. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Seeing none, does anyone see any reason we should keep the record open? Could you keep it open just uh, for me checking my email to see if Kim Rose sent me some comments? Any objection from the applicant? No. Okay. So we will close the record except for an email from Representative Rose, which we will put into the record if there is one um, received by today. Um, otherwise, the record is closed, and we will vote on this likely uh, next meeting. Thank you.
right. if, if you guys could please um, exit quietly, because we have a few more items on the agenda that we need to take care of before we leave. The next item on the agenda is liaison reports. Anyone with the report? Uh, there was no meeting with the police commission. The next item on the agenda is regulation subcommittee. Mr. Grant. Uh, at our next uh, meeting, we'll have a uh, handout of recommended uh, zoning regulation changes and deletions for you to review. It'll be quite extensive, so I would suggest that everybody really take a look at them. And any questions, no, contact us. Nope. To you. <laughs> Again, if you could please exit quietly so we could finish our meeting. Why don't we uh, we'll go back to the subcommittee report. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Would anyone like to make a comment or a motion? Mr. Mead, uh, motion to approve. I second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor. Anyone against? Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is chair's report. I do not have a report. Next item on the agenda is staff report. Any report? Not this evening. The last item on the agenda is regulation subcommittee report. Uh, I, at our next meeting, I will have a substantial uh, number of recommendations from the board for deletions and additions uh, and changes to our regulations. Uh, I would like uh, everybody to really take a look at it. Any questions that you have when you start reviewing it, uh, to either call uh, the, the staff or uh, contact me, and then I can contact the staff. Thank you. Any new business? Seeing none, um, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>